that is a vegetarian's paradise, Brazil. Uh, oh, <laughs> wow. Oh. Well, we just we just really had a wonderful time eating uh, that beautiful food there in their country. Um, <clears throat> I want to suggest that we pray one more time before we open God's word, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this beautiful Sabbath day. Yes, it is cold outside, but it is a glorious, a beautiful, sunshiny day, and we thank you for this day of rest and for this place here for peaceful uh, fellowship and worship still with the freedom that, that is afforded us. And uh, we know that we will not always have this freedom, but we want to pause and thank you for that freedom that we have now. Please help us to make the best use of this time that we may study and work and share uh, to hasten the coming of Jesus. We ask your special blessing upon our study of your word this morning, that your spirit will be here to touch our hearts, open our minds, open our hearts to receive your word as food for the soul. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My time in Brazil was a very interesting one. My wife and I went down for three weeks. My book was published in Portuguese a year ago or so. And um, we were invited down to do a, a book tour, a speaking tour and a book tour for three weeks. And um, the fellow who translated the book is named Hander Heim. Does that sound Portuguese? What does it sound like? He's German and he's German. <laughs> and I'm telling you, he booked me every single day for three weeks and sometimes five and six presentations in the same day. German, yes. <laughs> he wore us out, but we had a wonderful time. But just before I went down there, I was um, given, uh, sent an email by Betsy Mayer from um, Heartland, and she heard that I, she read one of my newsletters, and she realized I was going to Brazil and she wanted to warn me. She said, when you get to Brazil, I have to tell you that graduates from Heartland are being disfellowshipped down in Brazil because of their belief in uh, uh, the nature of Christ. And I know that that's what you believe and teach, so you need to be careful when you're down there. Well, then when I got down there, I was also given several um, trigger phrases to avoid in my presentations because I would be rejected and, and not invited back to Brazil, all having to do with the nature of Christ, uh, perfection of character, things like that. And I thought, wow, I have no testimony if I don't talk about the nature of Christ and perfection of character. Uh, you see, I you, you all know where I came from, I think, most of you. Um, I came from the gay life in Southern California 21 years ago. Uh, tell someone like me that you cannot overcome sin. Then, then what's the point? And if we can't overcome sin, why are we trying to make Sabbath keepers out of Sunday keepers? See, the logic just falls apart when you start applying that specifically to issues that we don't approve of. You know, we, we uh, I think Jesus said that you traverse the world to make a proselyte or something like yourself, and you make him twice the child of the devil than yourself, something like that. I mean, we go the world over evangelizing, trying to make Sabbath keepers out of Sunday keepers. If we don't believe we can overcome sin, then what are we doing? We have no reason to exist. I'm going to talk about that in the next service though, so I better not get distracted. But anyway, I have found recently that people like me are dismissed with the label of perfectionist. Now, I'm not a perfect person. I don't claim to be perfect. I mean, Job didn't claim to be perfect and God thought he was. Um, but does that mean I can't talk about perfection? 
And because of my, the nature of my testimony, I preach sermons, be ye therefore perfect, uh, about victory and overcoming and, and transformation of character. And I am dismissed by many Seventh-day Adventists as a perfectionist when I'm simply reading the word of God, the words of Jesus himself. So recently, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Portland, Oregon. I was involved in a forum there uh, in the North Pacific Union Conference. Uh, they had put together a forum called Gays in the Family. And they are opening up to a group of us who have formed um, kind of an umbrella organization called Coming Out Ministries. And the Lord has brought several of us together that have come out of the gay life over the years that believe the same about victory and overcoming. And, and um, so as a group, we're now appearing at, at conventions and you know GYC, ASI, and various places. And as a group, uh, the impact is kind of impressive. I've been doing uh, conventions for years, but I'm one person, and, and uh, so people have labeled me as the exception, and therefore I'm not as credible being one person, but you get five people together with the same story, and now all of a sudden, how do you call them an exception? It's a growing number, and I'll tell you in Brazil, which is riddled with the gay issue, Every presentation I gave, someone came to me to talk about this issue in their lives, in their families, in their churches. Uh, it is a huge issue in Brazil. Well, in fact, it is a global issue. And, and we know, as in the days of Lot, so shall it be you know, in the last days. And um, so this is a global issue. But after this forum in Portland, Oregon, a couple of weeks ago, there were people there who did this movie called Seventh Gay Adventist. Have you heard of that? It's an abomination because, first of all, they pervert the name, the God-given name Seventh Day Adventist. I even wrote to them and say, why don't you just call it Gay Seventh Day Adventist or Seventh Day Adventist Gays? To say Seventh Gay, what is a Seventh Gay? What is a Sixth One? What is an Eighth One? What do you, it means it is pointless. They're trying to be cute with the name, but I think it's, uh, I mean, borderline blasphemous, frank, frankly. But um, the movie is all about the feelings and emotions of these three gay couples. Uh, one of them I know personally. He was the one who, when I came out of that life 21 years ago, he said, Ron, I'm going to be watching you. And if you can pull this off for two years, then I'll know there's hope for me too. Isn't that something? I came across him at, uh, in Toronto at the General Conference when it was in Toronto a few years ago. And I saw him and I cornered him and I sat him down and I said, we need to talk. And we had a nice visit and I finally said, you know, David, um, do you remember the last conversation we had? Yes, I do. Do you remember telling me you were going to be watching me? Yes, I remember. And if I pull this off for two years, yes, yes, yes. I said, David, it's been nine. What's holding you back? He said, I'm not interested. You know, his time passed. His conviction came and went. Now he's real strong in SDA kinship, and he's the lobbyist for that group uh, that goes around to all the conventions and general conference and, and various conventions and conferences trying to get a foot in the door and promote homosexuality within the church. He's not interested. Well, he is in this movie. Well, it's all about their feelings and emotions, and the, the, the main thing that comes out of this movie is how they have been offended by the church. Well, let me ask you, have you ever been offended by anyone in the church? Well, let's make a movie, right? I mean, why take one sin issue and make it sound like that's the only issue that ever finds offense in the church? You know, the church is a like a rock tumbler, and we rub shoulders and we those rough edges, you know, we get on each other's, we grate on each other, don't we sometimes? 
But that's the, the polishing that goes on. And we'll be looking at some of that in this subject today. But that whole movie is about how these people feel, their emotions, their hurt feelings, their desires. And they want to be looked upon as normal and everything. You know what's missing in that movie? Not one text of scripture not one quote from the spirit of prophecy, and never once, how does God feel? Never once. See, that's totally upside down. That is self-centered. That is totally opposite of Christianity. And they are labeling themselves as Christians. Well, they were there at this forum two weeks ago. And the the lady who, and husband were there who made this movie, and she immediately wrote up a review for Spectrum Magazine. Have you ever read Spectrum Magazine? Do you know anything about it? It, why not? I think it's the liberal left wing <laughs> of the church. And I was, I was, I read the whole article, and I was encouraged by one thing. The one presenter at this conference that gave the most liberal view and the most open arms to anyone to come into his church, a pastor, got the best review in that article. I got the shortest review and the worst one. Well, that, that encouraged me because it showed I was on the opposite end of this all-inclusive, come-as-you-are, salvation in, in sin message. And in that, it was like two sentences, and I was dismissed as a, well, we all know about his perfectionist theology. And I thought, hmm, wow. Um, so out of that was born this subject <laughs> today, the dangers of perfectionism. In fact, I'm working on another one called Confessions of a Perfectionist. And I think that could turn into a book, <laughs> Confessions of a Perfectionist, in quotes. Um, and I'm doing this because he, at that conference, something was dismissed uh, using the term perfectionism. Evidently, this is a uh, trigger phrase within Adventism that is now to be avoided. Um, if you quote a scripture about being perfect, then you're a perfectionist. If you talk about overcoming, you're a perfectionist. Um, so let's look at that. First of all, I went to the uh, computer dictionaries and I looked up the word perfect. And just to give you some highlights from these definitions, perfect, being entirely without fault or defect. Now, as I read these definitions, take them in light of Christian or Christian thinking, being entirely without fault or defect. Anything wrong with that? Satisfying all requirements. Anything wrong with that? Corresponding to an ideal standard. Do we have an ideal standard? What is it? Jesus. Who is it? Jesus. Corresponding to an ideal standard. What's wrong with that? Faithfully reproducing the original. Don't we read that when Jesus sees his character perfectly reflected and reproduced in his people, he'll come. Lacking in no essential detail. There are many definitions. Uh, conforming absolutely to the description or definition of an ideal type, entirely without any flaws, defects, or shortcomings. Uh, the word perfection and exemplification of supreme excellence. What's wrong with striving for that? Isn't that what God wants of us, his children? Don't we want that in our children? We have a young man back here. Doesn't your mother want you to um, exemplify supreme excellence in all you do, in your schoolwork, in your piano playing and all that? Isn't that kind of a goal? Isn't that an aspiration? So what's wrong with that? Perfectionism. Now, I, I have thought within Christian circles that perfectionism was defined as one who reaches a point where they think that no matter what they do, it's no longer sin. And then you get these fanatics out there that are swapping wives and everything else because they're holy and they can do it now. Um, but perfectionism, 
is defined as the doctrine that the perfection of moral character constitutes a person's highest good. Well, then I think I must be a perfectionist because I believe that. The theological doctrine that a state of freedom from sin is attainable on earth. That is right out of the dictionary. So I guess I am a perfectionist. I have been offended by that term until I started looking it up. You see, people throw these terms around and they don't even realize what the definitions are. They make it a derogatory term. You know, I grew up being called a goody-goody. Well, what's wrong with being good? But that was a derogatory term. Being a goody-goody was bad. And now people say, man, that's bad. And that means good. And it used to be that if you were gay, you were happy, you were cheerful, you were a lot of fun to be around. Now if you're gay, whoa, it's a totally different thing. So we redefine words as we go along from generation to generation. Now, as I was looking this up, the Internet deviated with, I mean, from these definitions, it sounds like perfect, perfection and perfectionism are all wonderful things, right? Then immediately it goes into giving ten tell, telltale traits of perfectionists. And they're all negative. All or nothing thinking, critical eye, push versus pull, unrealistic standards. Unrealistic standards? When we just read the definition that they are realistic. Focus on results, depressed by unmet goals, fear of failure, procrastination, defensiveness, low self-esteem. All of these things are traits of a perfectionist. So <laughs> that left me a little confused. And then it went on to give tips on overcoming perfectionist traits. If you find that you are a perfectionist, here's how to overcome. Well, I know how to overcome being perfect. Just sin. I don't need tips on how to sin, do you? <laughs> so anyway, now I know. Here, here now you have all these tips on how to overcome your perfectionist traits as if it is a bad thing to be a perfectionist. So let's go to the Bible, shall we? In regards to the subject of perfection and perfectionism, let's consider what does our Lord require of us? And this is the thing. If you go to the word of God, um, all of these things are resolved. And where I see all of these accusations and these slanders and these uh, the, the derogatory expressions and so forth, they're not based upon the word of God. They don't quote scripture when they give you these labels. But what does the Lord require? Matthew 5.48. I don't know if you want to just jot down some texts. I have them all typed out in my notes so that I don't have to take the time to look them up. And so if I go fast, you might want to jot them down. Um, Matthew 5.48, the words of Jesus. Here's what the Lord requires of us. Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So I don't think that's a derogatory thing. And in Chronicles, and I forgot to put which one, first or second, maybe it's third Chronicles, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's probably either first or second. Uh, Solomon. Oh, for those of you, uh, it's tongue-in-cheek, there are only two, Okay. Uh, Solomon is talking to his son, and he's encouraging him to serve the Lord, uh, the God thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. You know, in just one or two of these texts of scripture, you can see what perfection involves. A perfect heart, a willing mind. If we perfectly submit, if we give an entire surrender of the will, we have a perfect heart, and we can have that immediately. You think about the thief on the cross. Did he have time to keep the Sabbath holy? Did he have time to go through all Ten Commandments and demonstrate that he could keep them? No. And yet Jesus assured him he would be in paradise. Why? He instantly 
had a perfect heart. He was converted. And so a person, I believe, in the eyes of the Lord can become perfect very quickly with a perfect heart. Now, we judge by outward appearance and behavior and so forth, but God winks at the times of ignorance because people with a perfect heart go to church on Sunday. People with a perfect heart do a lot of things that we don't do anymore. But they're coming along. It's like the rose bud. If I give my wife a rose bud on our anniversary, she's thrilled if it's perfect. <laughs> but the next day, it's different. It's starting to open a little bit. Oh, and it's perfect in that stage. And in every stage, until it's in full blossom, it can be perfect. And I think that's what the Bible is trying to tell us. If we have a perfect heart, we're like the rosebud. And now the Lord will work with us day by day. And with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trial. You know? and, and we can be, uh, we can have a perfect relationship. But we never call ourselves perfect because we could stumble. And we always remember where we have stumbled. And so we always, as we're looking to Jesus, we never feel perfect. Uh, one of the Chronicles, 28 verse 9. <laughs> uh, first or second. Um, uh, now, Second Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 9. Hanan Hanani the seer to Asa, king of Judah. Uh, he says, the Lord shows himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The Lord expects perfection in his people. And we expect that in our children, don't we? <laughs> and we work with them to achieve that. We don't throw them out because they're not, but we, we tr that's why we educate, that's why we teach, that's why we train, and that's why we... Uh, practice patience because they're not perfect to begin with, but we want them to, be, to get to that point. Why perfection? Why is it necessary? What's the point? What's the purpose? In uh, 1 Kings 8, verse 61, let your heart therefore be perfect. I'm just giving the highlights, the context in verses 60 and 61. Let your hearts therefore be perfect with the Lord our God, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God. Now in the text, it's, it's reversed. It puts that the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God. Let your heart therefore be perfect. You see, we are to give the world a picture of Christ. And don't we want to give an accurate, adequate picture of Christ? If we profess to be Christian and we willingly and knowingly disobey Christ, what does that tell the world about Christ? Because, for one thing, sin hurts people. And if you're hurting people, are they going to want to see that image of Christ in you? They don't want to see that. Uh, many texts of scripture about perfection of character. Who is it that calls for and expects perfection among Christians? In Genesis chapter 17, when Abram was 90 years old, God told him, walk before me and be thou perfect. And in Deuteronomy 8, 13, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 our Lord Jesus Christ, um, Paul is talking and, and appealing to the brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the, in the same judgment. Um, Colossians 1, 27 to 29. I'm just skipping through to kind of answer these questions. Who is it that calls on us to be perfect? Um, we are to be present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Well, it's our creator our God himself, our Savior, that wants us to be perfect. Jesus, when you think about it, his name means deliverer, his name means Savior, and Gabriel said to, to Joseph, I want you, God wants you to name him this, 
because names are very significant in the Hebrew culture. And he says, I want you to name him this, meaning deliverer. Why? Because he will deliver. He shall save his people from their sins. Now, is he going to do a poor job of that? If he's the creator and he's the recreator, is he going to recreate imperfection? Can you see how with almost any single text, the point is clearly made? Jesus, if he is truly our Lord and our master, then don't we give him, render him unquestioning obedience if he's a Lord and a master? And he is love, so he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he works in us to will and to do. He who's begun a good work will perform it. He will perform it. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's not a quitter. He's not going to quit until he works in us that perfection of character that he wants. He is the creator, and he is not out to create a defective vessel. So how a Christian can believe in sinning until Jesus comes and ridicule someone for being a perfectionist without realizing who they're ridiculing is the creator of perfection. He's the one that's being criticized, isn't he? Do we have biblical examples of perfection of character? Oh, yes, of course, Jesus. Everyone says, well, Jesus was perfect. Well, and other people say, well, of course, he was perfect. He was God. Well, that's true, but is that the whole truth and nothing but the truth? It's so easy for me to digress into another sermon, but I won't. Um, I'll try not to. Do we have biblical examples of perfection? Yes, Jesus, but also in Ezekiel chapter 14, though these three men, you know who they were, right? Noah, Daniel, and Job. Though these three men were in the land, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Righteousness means right doing. Righteousness is perfection. Is that right? Because righteousness means doing what's right. And if you're doing what's right, what more does the Lord require? Um, Enoch walked with God. Genesis 5 verse 24 uh, and in Genesis 6, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Now, does this mean these people had never sinned? No, it means they were overcomers. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God does not um, dismiss us as being imperfect because we have sinned. But we'll be dismissed as imperfect if we choose to continue in sin. All of these men had sin. There's King David, and we know about his sins. 1 Kings 15, verse 14, about Asa. King Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. Now, that's hard to imagine, but that's what the word says. And I didn't write it, but I'm reading it, and I'm encouraged by it. And it goes on with... Uh, Various ones whose hearts were perfect uh, with the Lord all their days. Um, do we have examples of people God himself has declared to be perfect? I mean, there's a list here of people that the Bible says are perfect, but of course the Bible was written by men, right? So what about God himself? Does God declare anyone to be perfect? Job, Job 1 verse uh, 8 and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? Isn't that encouraging? God is saying that about Job in this story. Do you suppose he has ever said that to Satan again? I'm sure. Yes, uh, he's giving us an example here, but... Surely, throughout history, God could have said the same thing. You know, in um, 
in the Bible, there's not one sin listed against Daniel. Of course, we know that he sinned because all have sinned. The same with Job. But there's not one sin. Everything you read about Daniel is perfection. Perfection of character. Everything he did that's recorded is perfect. I think what the Lord said about Job, he could have said about Daniel and others throughout the Bible. So yes, God declares people to be perfect. Um, but then the Bible also makes comparisons between imperfect and perfect. Um, Solomon, his heart was not perfect with the Lord, imperfect, as was the heart of David his father. Solomon was imperfect, David was perfect. And you look at the two of them and they were equally sinful, weren't they? So what's the Lord looking at? The heart, the conversion, the change of direction. But the Bible repeatedly says and refers to the heart of David. This king was not, his heart was not as perfect as was the heart of David. And that's said over and over and over about one king after another, after another, after another. So there's this comparison. And David repeatedly is referred to as having a perfect heart. Now, are we to judge people in their hearts to see uh, make judgment about perfection. We can learn from the Bible who is not the judge of perfection. Remember Hezekiah when he was sick and he was pouting with his face towards the wall, bottom lip all poked out and weeping and all that and and he says, Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. He's telling the Lord that he has had a perfect heart. But he's not the one to make that judgment, is he? Job said, if I say I am perfect, I shall also prove, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. I would despise my life. Job 9, 20 and 21. So we are not to judge our own hearts as perfect or imperfect. Well, I think it's safe to judge imperfection. I mean, we know when we've sinned. We know when we make mistakes. But we cannot judge the heart as perfect. Now, the Bible also shares with us how we do not attain to perfection. And this, I think, is very important because... Uh, I think this is where perfectionism comes in the way we look at it today. In Galatians chapter 3, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Do you make yourself perfect? No. The obvious answer, the implied answer is no. Galatians 3, verses 3 to 6. Um, it, it goes on to allude to the fact that he doeth, Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So we're not made perfect by keeping the law. And that's the point. And this is where some people make mistakes. They think that if they keep the Ten Commandments. Can you think of someone in the Bible who felt that he was perfect? Well, he didn't have assurance, but he thought he was pretty good. And he came to Jesus, the rich young ruler. All these I've kept from my youth up. Well, then why was he asking, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He could not see where he was at fault, and yet he did not have assurance because he was looking to the law. He was looking to his own actions, his outward behavior, but he was not looking upon his heart. You do not attain to perfection through the works of the law or through the Levitical priesthood we read in Hebrews 7. Uh, Hebrews 10, for the law, talking about the ceremonial law, can never, with those sacrifices, make the comers thereunto perfect. Keeping the letter of the law, ceremonial law or otherwise, does not make someone perfect. In Revelation 3, verses 2 and 3, uh, in Jesus' words to the church of Sardis, I have not found thy ways perfect, thy works perfect before God. So how do we attain to perfection? Because Jesus says, be ye perfect. So how do we do it? We don't do it by keeping the law. 
keeping the law comes natural to the perfect heart. You don't get a perfect heart by keeping the law. You see, there's a difference. Um, in Luke, well, let's look at the rich young ruler briefly. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said unto the rich young ruler, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. So there you go. So if you will all go out and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, poor, you will attain perfection. Is that what it's saying? No, he said that to the rich young ruler because he looked upon his heart and he saw something there. What was it that he saw? He said, thou shalt have treasure in heaven. That's not where the end of the sentence is. He says, and come and follow me. Now couple that with a tempting lawyer of Luke 10. And what you come up with is, if you want to have a perfect heart, love God supremely and your neighbor as yourself. If you put things in the right perspective, um, when I was talking with Ed last night, I mean, he brought out something that to me was like a light bulb. I said, well, that's it. It's that simple. We tend to keep focusing upon our mistakes and we keep trying to overcome our faults and our mistakes. And as we keep focusing on that, we just can tend to do more of it. We need to focus on him. As we focus on Christ, what is it in 2 Corinthians 3.18? It says basically by beholding him, we become changed. You become like what you focus upon. If you keep focusing upon yourself, you will become more and more like yourself every day, which is not good. If you will focus upon Jesus Christ, you become more and more like him. Uh, I mean, I remember as a little boy how I would admire someone, you know, like a, one of the older fellows at camp, the counselors or somebody, and uh, they just had it all together and they were kind and, you know, to us young people. And pretty soon I found myself imitating the way he walked, the way he dressed, the way he combed his hair. I wanted to be like that person. I was focusing upon that person. Now we transfer that theologically and in our own religious experience, focus upon Jesus as we, and how do we focus upon him? We read his mind. We read his thoughts. We listen. We contemplate. We listen to the Holy Spirit. We commune with him. We develop a relationship. And as we do that, without consciously, constantly making these efforts, we just become more and more like him. We have passages in the spirit of prophecy that tell us that when our will is perfectly submitted to his will, uh, something to the effect that in carrying out his will, we discover we're just doing our own thing because our wills have become one. Beautiful passages of scripture. Um, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, to be laborers together with God. And then one, and every year, you probably hear me harp on this text. I have 1 Corinthians 5, 17, but I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That means a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And if we're in Christ and all things are become new, new is Jesus works out his perfection in us. Uh, Ellen White's commentary on that is the new birth consists of new motives, new tastes, and new tendencies. I'll tell, I can't tell you what that means to someone like me. Well, and see, I read this while I was still in the gay life 21 years ago, 22 years ago. And I realized that in being born again, I could have new tendencies. 
And within a year, I was married. I have children and grandchildren. And there are people out there who oppose me in ministry and say, you're never going to be different. You're faking it. Uh, if you're ever tempted, you're still the same. And I said, well, Jesus was tempted in all points like as me. Are you calling him names? Are you labeling him? Because yet without sin, you don't label people by the nature of their temptations. And I just say, I was baptized on February 7, 1992. Satan wasn't. I changed directions. He didn't. I can't control what temptations he comes up with from day to day. Sometimes I'm absolutely shocked with what he thought of this morning. I mean, where did that come from? You know, that reveals him. It doesn't reveal me. I choose to throw it back. I, you know, not interested. Nice try. You know, and I throw it back. Um, but people want to label others by the nature of their temptations. That's not biblical because you wouldn't dare do that to Jesus. And not only was he tempted in all points, he suffered being tempted, which means he struggled. So you don't label someone because they're struggling with temptation. You praise them for their victories and the choices that they go, or that, that, that they make. And Jesus struggled with temptation until his last breath on the cross, yet without sin. Um, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of, of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. The Bible is just full of these types of statements. In Ephesians 4, verse 11, we read about the gifts of the spirit. And there are all kinds of gifts, and no one person has all the gifts. And so that tells me, uh, well, the Bible says that they're given so that uh, we can become perfect. Uh, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the gifts of the Spirit are given to the church. We need to appreciate them in other people because the gift that they have may be working for our perfection. We need to use the gifts that are given us we need to accept them as we see them in other people, not to be jealous of them for having them. The Holy Spirit is not going to give everyone the same gifts. And, as, and this is one reason it's important to assemble and to fellowship because then you get all the gifts together in one congregation and one church family or whatever, and they work together for your perfection of character. Uh, Colossians 3, 14 and 15. Charity is the bond of perfectness. But there again, love God first, others second, yourself last. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. All scripture given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Um, so scripture is for that. There are so many texts here, we're going to run out of time. I want to um, share with you some quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy that, what did I do with, oh, here it is, it's over here. I was charging up my iPad. Some amazing quotes. Um, I'm just going to have to skip a lot of material here because I want to go to those quotes. But ultimately, who is it that works out perfection among God's people? 2 Samuel 22, verse 33, God maketh my way perfect. Psalm 18, 32 to 33, it is God that maketh my way perfect. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 10 to 11, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Does God need help? Or does he want help in working for one another's perfection? Well, it sounds like he does. He doesn't need it, but he wants it. He wants us to pray for one another. As we're praying for one another, what does that do? 
it perfects our hearts. When I start praying for someone that I'm angry with, I cease being angry. And that anger turns to pity, and the pity to love and concern and compassion. And so we are to work with God. We're to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. If he's in the spirit of intercession, we should be in the spirit of intercession, right? If he's in the seat of judgment, we're not to be in the seat of judgment. I can say that because he says, judge not. But he does want us to be in the spirit of intercession. Um, we have, of course, many rewards for those who have attained perfection of character. I want to go to these spirit of prophecy quotes. I'll take a few minutes here to share these because these I found to be so encouraging and just amazing. And one thing I've noticed about people who denounce perfectionists or they denounce the message of perfection of character, they don't tend to read or approve of or accept the spirit of prophecy. It seems to be a common trait. So let me just share some of these with you. And I don't know what all of these acronyms stand for, like PCP and MCP, but anyway, I have the references. Um, if you want these references, see me later. I'm just going to read these because we're out of time. He came to fulfill all righteousness and as the head of humanity, this is talking about Jesus, to show man that he can do the same work, meeting every specification of the requirements of God. Through the measure of his grace furnished to the human agent, not one need miss heaven. Perfection of character is attainable by everyone who strives for it. Now, isn't that pretty black and white? I mean, that is, I love it when I have a statement that is so strong and so emphatic that there's no way to question it. The only way to question it is to question her inspiration. And that's what many do. Per perfection, uh, that's one of those MCP quotes. And I don't know, it's two MCP, there you go. Two MCP 571. But yeah, I'll give you these references after if you want them. Perfection of character is attainable by everyone who strives for it. This is made the very foundation of the new covenant of the gospel. So... If we're preaching the gospel, we must preach perfection of character or we are not preaching the gospel. Here's another one. DA, that must be desire of ages. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, Christ continued, he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. Oh, you mean we can do miracles and we can walk on water and we can heal the sick? Well, I think it means if I can obey, you can obey, Right? The Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united to humanity. By the way, that's fallen humanity. Because if I'm going to be like Christ, then I have to link my fallen humanity with his divinity. I must be a partaker of his divinity in my fallen nature. And I cannot be like Christ if he did not have a fallen nature. But there again, that's another sermon, and I have all the quotes that show that his nature was fallen. Ellen White even goes so far as to talk of Jesus' sinful nature. That is pretty plain. And I praise God for his sinful nature because he did not sin even with a sinful nature. And that helps me. Uh, the Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united to humanity. He came to the world to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. You like that? My heart just skips a beat when I read these things. 664. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if 
They will be in subjection to God as he was. Pretty plain, isn't it? Two selected messages, 32. And while we cannot claim perfection of the flesh, we may have Christian perfection of the soul. When we surrender ourselves wholly to God and fully believe the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, through faith in his blood, all may be made perfect in Christ Jesus. Thank God that we are not dealing with impossibilities. We may claim sanctification. We may enjoy the favor of God. We don't claim perfection. We claim sanctification, which is obedience. Uh, obedience is sanctification. And we go forward from day to day. The reason we don't claim perfection, I believe, is because we can still choose to sin. And you can live a life of perfection, and just before crossing over the Jordan, you may lose your temper and not be able to be translated without tasting of death. You ever hear of anyone like that? Moses was saved, but he was not, he was not, he represents those who are not translated without seeing death because he sinned, uh, he, he um, failed, but he was forgiven, but he tasted of death. PCP, that's the one I don't know, PCP, 57. None need fail of attaining in his sphere to perfection of Christian character. By the sacrifice of Christ, provision has been made for the believer to receive all things that pertain to life and godliness. God calls upon us to reach the standard of perfection and places before us the example of Christ's character. God calls upon us to reach that standard. In his humanity, perfected by a life of constant resistance to evil. Notice, constant resistance. It was not a cakewalk for him. He was constantly having to resist evil. Um, I should have put my finger on it. The Savior showed that through cooperation with divinity, human beings may in this life attain to perfection of character. This is God's assurance to us that we, too, may obtain complete victory. These are the types of things that gave me, an unchangeable and an unreachable person in the world, courage to step out. I stepped out in faith that Jesus would do this for me. When all the world said I could not be changed. But I believed Jesus. I believed his word. I believed he was the creator. And I still do. Desire of Ages 668, all true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, here's the one I was referring to earlier, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. We're only doing what we love to do. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. How hard is it to do things that you hate? How hard is it to avoid things that you hate? It's easy, right? How many of us hate murder? How many of us commit murder? We don't. We, we don't like it. Now, if we can just develop that same hatred towards every temptation, we'll be doing well. As Christ lived the law in humanity, so we may do if we will take hold of the strong Capital S, strong Jesus for strength. Um, here's one from 5 BC, the Bible commentary, 1082. Letters have been coming in to me 
affirming that Christ could not have had the same nature as man, for if he had, he would have fallen under similar temptations. I love this one. I like this. If he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. If he was not a partaker of our nature, notice she's not saying Adam's nature, she's saying ours. He could not have been tempted as man has been. If it were not possible for him to yield to temptation, he could not be our helper. It was a solemn reality that Christ came to fight the battles as man in man's behalf. His temptation and victory tell us that humanity must copy the pattern. Man must become a partaker of the divine nature. So there you see it. Jesus in divine nature became a partaker of fallen human nature. We in our fallen human nature become partakers of his divine nature and we meet the enemy on the same plane as did Jesus. There's no excuse. Now, two more little quotes here and we'll wrap it up for, for this morning. Are we to attain to the perfection of his character? When God's servants reach this point, they will be sealed in their foreheads. What does that tell you? The 144,000 are all sealed. They, everyone is sealed at death, you know, one way or the other. The 144,000 are sealed living. And they are a unique people. I have a whole sermon on the 144,000, lessons from the 144,000. What is it that makes them unique? They have attained to perfection of character and they are sealed. And they are translated without tasting of death. Uh, to do that, they have to be total overcomers. Enoch could not be translated as a sinner. Moses could not be translated because he did sin. He had a taste of death. He was resurrected. Elijah could not be translated as a sinner. Does that make sense? The 144,000 will be translated without tasting of death because they have attained to perfection of character. And then let me read this last one from um, Volume 1 of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 13. It cannot be shown that the church did in the lifetime of Paul reach the state of unity, knowledge, and perfection here mentioned. She's referring to uh, Paul's writings about, uh, you know, the gifts of the Spirit and so forth that we may attain to perfection. And certainly the church did not enjoy these during her apostasy. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. And the period of her flight into the wilderness, Revelation 12 verse 6. So, where the Bible is talking about attaining to perfection of character, Ellen White is saying the early Christian church did not attain to perfection. The persecuted church did not attain to a perfection. The apostate church did not attain to perfection. Nor has she reached this state of unity, knowledge, and perfection since the labors of Martin Luther. So the Reformed church, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation did not attain to perfection. The church today is almost infinitely below this state of unity, knowledge, and perfection. Infinitely below the standard that we are expected to achieve. Now listen, and not until the Christians of the last generation of men shall be brought to the enjoyment of it by the last warning message. And all the means God may employ to prepare them to be translated to heaven without tasting death, will the ultimate design of the gifts be realized. So there again, is that not a reference to the 144,000? The last generation of God's people will attain to the perfection of character that we read about in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. Why do you think this message is so under attack in our church today? Satan knows that God's last day remnant church 
will attain to perfection of character. And if he can keep them from believing it, they'll never attain it and the Lord will not come. And that's why I see this major attack on the nature of Christ, perfection of character uh, in Brazil from the division level. I mean, Brazil is a division. From the division leadership all the way down, they have rejected the nature of Christ and they forbid it to be taught in their country. Um, you have to go in discreetly to teach it. You have a whole division of Seventh-day Adventists in danger, in jeopardy here. And what is happening is if you're teaching the nature of Christ to be the unfallen nature, you still believe in justification, pardon, forgiveness, love, and acceptance. But what you don't believe in is sanctification, obedience, perfection of character, victory and overcoming. Because if you understand Jesus to have the fallen human nature of man, you have justification and sanctification. All of these things line up. And so if we don't accept the fallen nature of Jesus Christ, then our theology is no different than all of the rest of Christianity. All Christians believe in forgiveness and pardon. They all want to go to heaven and they have to be pardoned to go there. But they don't understand preparation to go there. Prepare to meet thy God. And so maybe this is harsh. I don't mean it to be harsh. I'm just trying to be realistic. If we don't understand the nature of Christ to be fallen, then do we not accept the doctrine of Rome, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? Is that not where it comes from? Brazil is a Catholic country. And many, many of those Adventists came out of the Catholic Church. And they're being taught Catholic theology within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I came back from there feeling obligated if I'm ever invited back, I have to burst that bubble one way or another. Knowing what I know, studying what I've studied, if I don't go down there and try my best to open the eyes of God's faithful people in that country that are blind, I'm responsible. Diego Silva, is that his name, Silva? He knows this message. He loves this message. He preaches this message. He's an outcast in Brazil. It's a shame. It's a real shame. But I have found the same in this country. And I was warned down there that the, seventh, that the official position of the church is the fallen, the prelapsarian nature of Jesus Christ. And I told the chaplain there at the university that is not the official position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He said, in Brazil it is. I said, not even in Brazil. He said, what do you mean? I said, you have two schools of thought. Some of you believe in that and some believe in the fallen nature of Christ. This is not the official position, you know, the unfallen nature of Christ. And, you know, when I wrote my book, a fellow from the General Conference contacted me and said, Ron, you touched on the nature of Christ in your book. And I said, yes. He said, you probably ought to take that out. That's kind of a red herring. I said, if I take it out, I have no reason to write the book. That is what I studied that brought me into this church. This is Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. It was Seventh-day Adventist doctrine that gave me the answers to my life in the world. And it is the answer to the sin-sick world, of people of the world. And I left it in. I would not take it out. In Brazil, this chaplain said, I read your book. And you take the position in your book of the fallen nature of Christ. I said, that's right. And so he confronted me, and I was telling him about that. He said, when you write your next book, he said, you need to reverse that. And then you'll be welcome in Brazil all the time. In other words, recant. Right? Retract. Recant. I said, no, I can't do that. God's people must get this right if we are to be in the 144,000. If we are to be translated without tasting of death. If we're to be saved, we have to get it right. I mean, it's in our message. 
You know, Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, right? Remember that? And yet the whole Jewish church was, as a church, was lost. The Jews who accepted Christ became Christians. Um, today, I believe salvation is of the Seventh-day Adventist church. We have the message. The whole church may reject it, but it's here. It's in our theology. Salvation is in. It's found in our theology. We'll talk more about it in the next service. And I am so glad you have the visual aid up here that I can refer to throughout the next service. Um, that is beautiful. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary.